classes in statistical mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is... Temperature changes? Hmm? The temperature can change? Well, yes, the temperature could change. The molecules could move in or out of the door of the room. Um, you remember we were going to do this calculation of the potential energy and the force between two atoms? In order to do that, you have to know where they are. Yeah. And so that you need 10 to the 26 positions and velocities, those are position and velocity vectors, just to get where the atoms are and where they'll move in the next time step. And that would, of course, require storing that many numbers. That might actually approach being possible at this point if you could use all of the computers in the world at the same time. It's close to possible. However, in order to do that, you need to measure all 10 to the 26 of them simultaneously. Um, without resort to witchcraft and art not taught at this university, there is no obvious technical means of doing so. If you read other statistical mechanics books, you will find people saying it's impossible to do this. And, my, and you ought to think about things whenever someone says X is impossible. Now, there are reasons why something could be impossible. For example, it could be I measure the position of these four atoms at the same time, and one of them immediately vanishes to avoid violating a law of nature. That violates baryon conservation. Or it could be I do the measurement and it violates CPT invariance, even though there are no weak interactions involved. Impossible means you violated a law of nature. Well, there's no impossible but for sure, we do not know how to do this, and there's no sign we ever will know how to do this in an easy manner, and therefore the calculation can't be done. And now we get to the last bad part. Maybe it's the good part. Suppose you went out to the corridor with a real barometer, and you measure the, real, the air pressure out there rather than in here. Completely different set of atoms completely different set of positions, completely different set of momenta. Does the barometer think the air pressure out there and in here are the same? So somehow, we have this incredibly difficult calculation which is totally beyond anything that we can imagine doing, meaning you wait until you're my age and then you have your students do it on their pocket calculators. Um, we have this totally impossible calculation, and somehow it isn't doing anything, because if you were out there rather than in here, it would sort of give the same answer. Okay? So that is the statistical mechanics problem. And if you try to approach it by brute force mechanics, the way you calculate the orbits of the planets around the sun, you don't get something resembling a very satisfactory answer now, do you? Namely, there's no way of doing it. Nonetheless, the, obviously the molecules do it, so there must be some way of doing it. So the question we ask is, how do we manage to do this calculation? What do we do? Well, I will back off a bit and I will give a hint. And I will give, go back to the point where I said, we have a problem with the atomic model. And in case you're curious, the cookie is a snickerdoodle. No nuts? No nuts. Cool. <laughs> I, no, the only thing that has nuts are the diamond-shaped molecules behind you. They're baklava. Okay. Um, we have the issue the molecules are moving, right? And because the molecules are moving, the pressure is a function of time. Now. Is it a big function of time? No, if you just use the barometer, you don't see anything. However, suppose we moved into an anechoic chamber, a room that is completely 
acoustically isolated from the outside world. Um, if you're in an anechoic chamber and you move, you can hear your joints creak. You can hear your heart pump. And if you're my age and have not ruined your hearing by listening to rock music at 2,000 decibels for the last decade, you can hear this very odd hiss. That hiss, which is the lower limit of human hearing, if there's no other background noise to distract you, is the fact that the pressure on your eardrum is not quite a constant. It gives, it's technically not exactly white noise because it has a frequency dependence. That hiss is the air molecules hitting your ear, and it is just barely at the edge where if you've got good hearing and absolutely no background noise, you can hear it. Uh, well, of course, if you were a tiger, apparently you could hear it all the time. Tigers have much better hearing than people do, and they actually hear the background noise of the atmosphere. And so what we say is, let me get out a tablet. There it is. What we say is, here is the time vector. Here is the pressure, and the air pressure measured on, as a function of time wiggles. Now how would you actually measure this? You get a very good microphone, you screen out all the background noise, you capacitively couple, and you turn up the gain all the way. And the microphone is happy to report, report this background hissing noise, so you could actually measure it. You can also, however, if you rig things just right, say this is pressure versus time. Well, what do I do if I have a fluctuating signal? And the simple answer is I go in and I take some sort of an average of the signal. And if I have something that is big and somewhat squishy like a mercury surface, and responds only at low frequencies, like a barometer, the barometer sees some sort of an average of these wiggles. The average I'm showing here is what is called a time average. And so you have some function, I'm going to put this on the paper, and what you do is say I have an f of t which is fluctuating, I will integrate it from 0 to some capital T. I will take divide by 1 over T. It is now an average. And this is an average of F, the, say the force on the barometer surface. And therefore, in some sense, what I am measuring, if the instrument doesn't respond at high frequencies, is a time average. This equation is in the book. There is, however, one little complication, which is, gee, which average should I take? For example, instead of this one, I could say, I will take this, and I will square it, yes, and I will take the average of the square, and then, I will take the square root. And so I will take the I will take the average of the square of the quantity, and having averaged x square instead of x, I now have the average value of x square, the square root of which is some measurement of x. So far so good? Mm -hmm. Well, they're both legitimate. And so these are both legitimate alternative paths to taking a time average. But in either case, what we do is we take measurements at a whole series of points in time. Yes? And having taken the measurements at a whole series of points in time, we average them together. Okay, now there are two pieces beyond this. The first is, there, this is a time average. Furthermore, it is an operational, you actually did the experiment. It is an operational time average. You actually did the measurements and you got the result. Now I am going to go back 
and I'm going to talk about a different sort of average. And we are approaching explaining what we are going to do in statistical mechanics. We aren't there yet. And the other thing we could do, instead of taking a time average, we could set, do an experiment, which I actually did when I was younger than you, because I worked in a hospital in a blood chemistry and hematology lab. And there was an experiment in which let you count the number of blood cells, the density of blood cells in human blood. Under modern conditions, you use an automatic instrument, which is very clever and much simpler. But at the time, what you did is you took a blood drop, you diluted it considerably because you didn't want too many cells in the sample field, and you put it down on a very expensive microscope slide that had a well. We are looking down from exactly above, but there's a depth here. The well was broken into little square areas. And you went in and you counted the number of blood cells in some number of these areas. And because this was precision machine, this was very expensive back then. <coughs> You knew the depth, you knew the area, so you've counted the number of blood cells in each of these samples, sample volumes. And each of these is a representation of, it's a sample of the density of blood cells. Well, you had to put in the dilution factors and the volume issues and a few things. And therefore, you had measured the density of blood cells, number density, number per unit volume, by counting them. Of course, you actually only counted in a certain number of these squares. There were fluctuations, so there might be some number here, and there'd be a different number there, and there were fluctuations, but you took an average. What sort of an average is this? Well, there are two words I can put down on it, and one word is operational. That is, you actually do the experiment. I actually did it once. I worked in chemistry, not hematology, but I actually did this once, and they let me, led me through it. And the other part, between besides it's operational, is this is what is called an ensemble average. An ensemble is a collection. And so we have an ensemble, which is a collection of these samples, and we look at each element of the each of these elements. The word that we use when we refer to a single piece of the ensemble is an element. And we look at each element of the ensemble, and we get the value in that element, and then we average over all of the elements. Let me refer you back to to air pressure for an elemental ensemble average. We measure the pressure on a whole bunch of points scattered around the room. Not the whole room surface, but just a sample of little surfaces. And for each of these little surfaces, we measure the force on that little surface. And when we average over all of those little pieces, yes, each piece has fluctuations on it each piece the pressure is doing this, but the pressure is doing a different thing on each element of the ensemble. And therefore, when I combine the average over all of the elements, in some sense I get a better estimate of the pressure. Now, when I said there's an ensemble, there's one thing I did not quite say yet. We're doing an average. And the question is, should I weight each of these equally? Or should I weight some more and some less? Should I choose some elements as being more important than others? That's a choice. 